Hello, I'm Zuhra Yunus. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. South Africa records more than one million cases of coronavirus with hospital admissions rising steeply. What we experienced during the first wave, we are still going to experience it. At some point, our hospitals, our wards were full to the rafters. As vaccines to fight COVID-19 are rolled out across the world, we look at attitudes across Africa on getting the jab. They're counting the votes in Central African Republic, but was it an election in name only? Also in the program, Peter will join us with all the latest in sports. Could Barcelona captain Lionel Messi be heading out to play in the USA? Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. More than one million. That's the number of coronavirus cases that have been registered in South Africa since the outbreak began in March. And it comes just a few days after the authorities confirmed that a new, faster spreading variant had been detected in the country, the worst hit on the African continent. Some hospitals and medical centers have reported a severe rise in admissions. Frontline workers are already warning that hospitals will not be able to cope with this new spike. The General Secretary of One Nurses Union says the country's healthcare system could collapse. What we experienced during the first wave, we are still going to experience it. At some point, our hospitals, our wards were full to the rafters. We were putting patients on the tents, on tents. What is going to happen now during the second wave, of which it is more dangerous and brutal compared to the, to the first wave? Before COVID-19, we've been complaining about cross shortage of staff and cross shortage of material resources. There's no different. There's no new hospital that has been built. I'm joined now live by Nomsa Maseko, our correspondent in Johannesburg. Uh, Nomsa, more than one million cases. Uh, it's news no one wanted to hear, right? It's news that no one wanted to hear, but it was expected, with South Africa being the worst hit on the continent with uh, coronavirus infections, it was bound to happen. And also the fact that there is still a lot of movement around amongst people because it is the holiday period. People are still going to want to celebrate New Year's, um, even though the president and all other sectors of the government have been warning against um, the uh, you know, uh, public gatherings that are, uh, have been identified as super spreader events. Any announcement by President Ramaphosa on restrictions trying to deal with the spread? Well, in the next uh, about 20 or so minutes, President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to be addressing the country. This is a much anticipated uh, address by the president. You would recall that just a few days ago, he also made another address in which he chose the hotspots in the country and imposed restrictions only in those areas. But because this new variant is now spreading all over the country, chances are that the president is going to, uh, to be speaking about a, a nationwide strict lockdown and also the possibility that there will be a, a ban on the sale of alcohol is also on the cards because no. it's not just COVID-19 patients that are filling up the hospitals, but it's also trauma, which is uh, related to alcohol, crime and also car crashes. Uh, no, I'm saying brief. Can you tell us about uh, receiving COVID-19 uh, vaccine anytime soon in South Africa? Well, South Africa made a down payment about six days ago to the uh, COVAX facility fund, uh, and it has made a deposit for 10% of the population. As yet, we don't know when that vaccine will get here and who will get it first between the elderly and frontline healthcare workers. Thank you very much. That's our correspondent in Johannesburg, Nomsa Maseko. The new variant makes the need to roll out vaccination programs across the continent all the more pressing. But a question mark remains, even if this were possible, if an effective vaccine is made available, will people want to get it? A survey conducted by the Africa CDC shows that 79% of respondents in Africa would take a COVID-19 vaccine if it was deemed safe and effective. 
but the survey shows some significant variations in willingness across different countries, with 94% in Ethiopia saying they will take the vaccine. But only 59% in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's worth bearing in mind that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Africa CDC had noticed a global decline in people wanting vaccinations in general because of doubts over their efficacy and safety and the spread of misinformation about vaccines. On average, 18% of respondents believe that vaccines generally are not safe and 25%, that's one in four, believe that a COVID-19 vaccine would be unsafe. I'm joined now from uh, Plansburg by Dr. Vicky Bailia, senior research uh, scientist uh, at Vaccine and Infectious Disease Analytics in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Bailey, you were part of the team uh, that oversaw the AstraZeneca trials in South Africa. Based on the results of those trials, is the vaccine safe? It is. It's definitely very safe. Um, so we vaccinated over two and a half thousand people. Um, and in those people, we saw one severe adverse event, which was basically a fever over 40 degrees Celsius. And then the participant took Panado and overnight he, he felt better. And that was the worst we saw in the trial. We're obviously still um, doing a lot of follow up visits with all of the participants to make sure that this stays the norm. Um, so we see them on scheduled visits um, sort of every second or third week. And as well, if any of them feel sick at any point, they come in and we do more illness visits and more um, testing for COVID. So where do you think the mistrust comes from then? I think it was mistrust before we even started with COVID. Um, so you've always heard about the anti-vaxxing. Um, and I think it comes from transparency and a lack of information that's given out quickly enough. So I think um, we've seen it, especially in the COVID vaccine trials, um, information is released very quickly um, and en masse so that everybody can actually see the data um, and see for themselves that it's safe. And I think prior to this, um, we necessarily didn't get out the information as quickly and people read into that that we were trying to hide things. So I think it comes down a lot to misinformation um, and believed um, that we're holding things back. Uh, but Dr. Bailey, I don't know whether you've noticed in discussions, uh, most of this mistrust is mostly aimed at um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Why do you think that is so? Definitely. I think the problem is um, people just link um, big pharma and vaccines. They don't realize that it's everyday people um, and everyday scientists that are out there testing the vaccine and we, we're making sure that it is safe. Um, I've got no vested interest in this vaccine. Obviously, we just, we're doing it to try and, and help people and to prevent more disease spreading. So I think it's just people don't understand that it is everyday people that are actually testing the vaccine and we're trying to get that information out there. So um, there's a program called Team Halo, um, which is a United Nations led initiative um, that is promoting um, the everyday scientists that are involved in the COVID vaccine trials and other vaccine trials just to try and allow people to see and put a human face to vaccine trials and make them realize that it's not only big pharma that's involved, um, there's a lot of other people involved that can be trusted. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, there were some mistrusts earlier before even the pandemic. In your experience, uh, has the population or your community directly benefited from uh, this vaccine? Um, so, I mean, we've, we've only managed to vaccinate two and a half thousand participants for COVID. Um, and I, I mean, we were turning people away left, right and centre um, to get into this and other vaccine trials or COVID uh, vaccine trials that we are running. Um, but even before that, we've um, trialled a lot of other vaccines. And definitely the, the community is starting to trust us a lot more and they are seeing the benefits from vaccines. Uh, rotavirus was the perfect example um, of a vaccine that we implemented and sort of within a year we went from a hospital being overrun with gastroenteritis cases in infants to hardly any admissions. So I think the communities are seeing the benefits of vaccines um, and I really hope that it's the same for the COVID vaccine. Thank you very much. That's the senior research scientist at Vaccine and Infectious Disease Analytics in South Africa, Dr. Vicky Bailey.
Counting is continuing after Sunday's election in the Central African Republic, with officials declaring them a success. However, with rebels uh, controlling much of the country and more than a quarter of the population displaced, it's hard to see how, to, how credible election was uh, possible. In the capital, Bangui, security was tight with armored vehicles outside some polling stations. But the situation outside Bangui is even more fragile and uncertain. In some areas, rebels seized election materials and uh, threatened those who tried to vote. Dr. Richard Moncrief is a project director at Central Africa at the Crisis Group. He's in the city of Rene in France for us. Uh, Dr. Moncrief, um, uh, so counting is underway, but how did the elections really go? Well, as you say, we, we, we don't know, not many people know what happened outside uh, Bongi. Uh, several of the uh, air prefectures of, of uh, the country, let's say four or five out of 19, were certainly affected by violence. So that's a large number of people who perhaps couldn't vote. Uh, perhaps they were threatened, as you say, by armed groups. Uh, so that is a significant worry. However, there are a lot of reports that say that where people could get out to vote, they certainly did in large numbers and they did with enthusiasm. And what they seem to say to people who talk to them is that they got out to vote to try to stop uh, armed violence and stop the kind of blackmail that armed groups are holding against the country and holding against elections. So we also saw a determination to get out and vote and hold these elections. Uh, given the brief analysis that you just gave me, how free were they then? Well, I, I think free, you know, they were, they were free. I mean, people would vote for who they uh, wanted to vote for, right? So I, I think that kind of free and fair element is there. Uh, secure. Now, of course, that this really is difficult. Um, the opposition are likely to uh, argue that they were not uh, properly held because of insecurity, while the government will reply to the opposition, well, you know, we can't be held hostage to armed groups. We, we've got to go ahead with elections. We have a constitutional deadline. A new president needs to be sworn in by the end of March. A delay would have been very dangerous. A delay would have been a more dangerous option. This is what the government and the United Nations would argue. So free and fair, I, I don't think there's too much argument about that. But of course, anything between 15 percent, that's the figure of the national and 30% perhaps of the uh, electorate couldn't vote because of insecurity. So that is significant. We can't ignore that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Moncrief, we heard reports of rebels, as we mentioned earlier, threatening those who tried to vote. What do you think will happen next? Well, it seems like elections have gone ahead. It seems like the government and all their international backers, including the UN, are determined to see the process through. So Monday the 4th, we're going to have preliminary results. Uh, and if, if it's not 50 percent for anyone, we're going to go to a second round. Now, the current sitting president enters this race pretty comfortably, partly because the opposition have not been clear in condemning what the armed groups have done over the next over the last few weeks so that's given him an extra advantage so he certainly goes into the race with an advantage now whoever wins there's going to be a big issue on the table and that's how does he revive a peace process with armed groups when most of those armed groups or, or a substantial number of them ripped up that peace process only a couple of weeks ago, just one week before, uh, you know, 10 days before the election. So that's what's going to be on top of his uh, his or her agenda uh, when he, he or her gets voted, uh, get, is inaugurated in March. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Richard Moncrief, uh, Project Director for Central Africa, the crisis group who's in France. Let's take a quick look at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. And counting is also underway in Niger, where voters are choosing a successor to President Mahamudu Isufu, who's stepping down after completing the permitted two terms in office. It's the first democratic transfer of power in Niger since it became independent from France in 1960.
Officials in Mozambique say the security forces have killed 37 Islamist militants in recent days. They also seized weapons used by the insurgents in the northern province of Cabo Delgado. Local media reported that at least six soldiers were killed in the clashes. Thousands of people have been killed and more than half a million displaced during the three-year insurgency in northern Mozambique. Across the world, extreme weather over the past year has been blamed for causing thousands of deaths and huge financial losses. According to the charity Christian Aid in East Africa, swarm of locusts ruined crops and vegetation. Floods in China and India alone caused $40 billion of damage, while hurricanes and wildfires in the U.S. caused $60 billion in losses. The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission says the number of people killed in an attack on a village in the western state of Benin Shangul Gumuz last week has risen to 207, including children. It's not known who the attackers were. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abi Ahmed had visited the region the day before to meet with locals to discuss the resurgence in ethnic violence. I'm now joined live by the BBC's Kalkidan Yibeltal in Addis Ababa. Uh, Kalkidan, the death toll is rising. How is the situation there? What do we know so far? Uh, it, it's a very uh, tragic story, and that's the story that we've been reporting since September. Uh, it seems that there is a resurgence, uh, there is a recurrence of ethnic violence in that region in western part of Ethiopia. And we know that uh, around 207 people were killed last week by uh, unknown assailants. Uh, the government uh, uh, blames what they call anti-peace elements for these attacks. And they also say that in, in, a, I mean, in an army of against these people, they have managed to uh, kill 42 of them. Uh, we understand that among those killed were uh, children and uh, and the elderly as well. And the death toll could rise because the attacks happen on villagers and some of uh, some of the people that are uh, missing are not accounted for. Uh, but those that have been accounted for are more than 200, 207, and that's a staggering number. We also understand that there are hundreds and possibly thousands of people who have fled the area for fear of more violence. Uh, Kalkidan, we know that uh, the Prime Minister Abi Ahmed was there recently to discuss the ethnic-related conflict. The asylums are targeting ethnic minorities. What more is the government doing about it? Uh, that, that's a question that everybody's asking now. Uh, as I said earlier, this is a, an area prone to violence. Uh, since September, there have been at least five such incidents uh, in which scores of people were killed. Many of them are ethnic minorities that seems, uh, and it seems that they were targeted due to their uh, the ethnicity. And uh, what's, what's peculiar in this situation is a day before uh, these attacks happened, the prime minister, uh, together with his top military and government officials, was there. Uh, discussing with local officials and uh, the residents on how to solve this situation. So it, it, it seems that the, the fact that this incident happened a day after uh, is emblematic that uh, the government is not doing enough or sufficient uh, actions. It's, it's not taking sufficient measures to control this area or it seems that the government is not in control of this area. Now we're hearing that uh, the military is deployed in this area and they are going to uh, take over uh, the, the, the security of the region. Thank you very much. That's Kalkidani Beltal, who's in Addis Ababa. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with Zuhra Yunus. Still to come. What is next for Lionel Messi? Could the Barcelona captain and superstar be heading to the US to play? You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports with Peter. Many thanks, Zura. And we start with uh, football. And uh, Manchester City and Everton match has been postponed for tonight. It is understood that City received more positive coronavirus results in their latest batch of tests. They had already confirmed on Christmas Day that Carl Walker and Gabriel Jesus had tested positive. All the same, two other games have gone ahead today, starting with Leicester City going to Crystal Palace. The game ended one all. Nigeria's Kelechi Ehelacho started that match, but 
missed a first half penalty. Ivory Coast winger Wilfred Zaha scored for Palace. Chelsea are still smarting from their loss against Arsenal on Saturday. They're in action against Aston Villa at the moment. The score there is uh, still nil-nil with just over 20 minutes gone. Now, Barcelona captain Lionel Messi says he hopes to one day play in the United States. Uh, Messi is still unsure of his future when his contract runs out in June this year. There's been a lot of speculation over his future after he asked for a transfer in April, in August, I beg your pardon. The 33-year-old can't start negotiations with overseas clubs in January. Messi is Barcelona's club record goal scorer. He's won 10 La Liga titles, the Champions League four times, and the Ballon d'Or six times. Now, could Nigeria striker Henry Onyekuru be on the verge of another loan spell? Onyekuru has struggled to play regularly for AS Monaco so far this season. The 23-year-old's career seemed to have stalled since grabbing headlines with a move to Everton three years ago. He's been speaking to sports journalist Olua Shino Okeleji. I had offers from top clubs, you know, bigger than Everton, but my first um, target was to play, not just to go to a big club, you know, I want to keep playing because I was very young then from UPN. I just got into professional football a year before the offers, you know, so I was a little bit nervous and um, happy as well. You add offers and then you add a medical at Paris Saint-Germain. We found out Henry sneaked out of Paris quietly at night. Um, what really happened? I mean, you've had medical, you were set to sign the next day. Why did you leave? Um, I would say the, the word used, the perfect word, sneaked out. I wouldn't say I was um, scared to be there or to compete, no. I just needed, at that point, I was very young. I needed to play. I just want to play, you know. Galatasaray and Istanbul was a blessing. I mean, you won the cup doubles and everything. Things were looking up for you. Um, Nigeria called you for the AFCON in Egypt, but you didn't really get enough time. Were you disappointed about how, how you were treated or how things went in Egypt? Um, disappointed, no, not really. I was happy at first, you know, to be there. Yeah, everybody wanted me to play. I wanted to play as well because I had a good season in Galatasaray, like you said, the cup and the, the league games and goals I scored there. So, yeah, I was a little bit, I won't use the word disappointed. Like, in my head, I was going to play, you know, not to start all games, but to get more time, you know. But at the end of the day, as a national team, the coach decide. I just have to keep working and be ready when my time comes. At the age of 23, I mean, you are contesting with undoubtedly some talented players like you pointed out in the Nigerian setup. How significant and how important is it for you to actually get regular playing time to get a chance with the national team? It's easy to say, but at the end of the day, you have to put it in work, you know, work hard, keep playing, do your thing, assist, score, and uh, I think the rest will be free in the front, yeah. Just score goals, it's a winger or striker or make assist, and uh, don't get injured. Henry, um, it's an unusual 2020 for everyone in football. Um, how would you sum up your own um, season and the year 2020? I would say I'm uh, a little bit disappointed, you know, the way the season went. Not just in football, you know, the COVID and everything. Uh, but uh, give thanks to God to be alive today, to witness uh, Christmas as well. And um, hopefully we hope for the best in 2021. Nigeria striker Henry Onyekuru there. Finally, tennis and six-time champion Roger Federer will miss the Australian Open for the first time in his career as he continues his recovery from knee surgery. The 39-year-old 20-time uh, Grand Slam winner has not played since January because of two operations. He had hoped to return to the delayed Australia Open, which starts on 8 February in Zubra, that's your sports. Thanks very much, Peter Koche, for all the sports updates. And don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on social media. You can get me specifically on at Venus Nyota. Well, that's all from the program. For me, Zuhra Yunus, and the rest of the Focus on Africa team, goodbye.